Hello, hello, welcome traders, welcome. Pretty sure everybody can see the screen just fine and uh, hear my voice. You know, it's one of those things, uh, a lot of us um, moderators, teachers, you know, online, when we host these online meetings, we always ask, but like, come on, it's 2020. Technology has advanced <laughs> beyond asking, hey, can you see my screen? But uh, hello and welcome. Today we're going to talk bits. We're going to talk bits, B-I-T-S, and we're going to talk uh, smart lists. We're going to take a look at some futures. Maybe we can get to some stocks. You know, I'm a work in progress here trying to fit a lot of information uh, inside a one hour time span. And uh, this is being recorded. I can see the little record logo. And I uh, should shoot out to most of you. I don't know um, how you guys receive these, whether it's by email or it's just posted onto the member section of the website. However you receive this, it is being recorded and you will receive it. Now, we just had the biggest trading uh, loss, single day loss since they're saying uh, the market crash uh, you know, basically Black Monday uh, uh, in 1987, where, you know, the Dow lost a total of 500 points. Well, obviously, back then, 500 points was something like uh, uh, it was, well, it was 22 percent. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, it makes you makes you think, damn, we, we've really come a long way. And, and you know what? Let me start here with this chart of uh, not this one. Let's let me push the weekly here. Uh, 20, well, this is 15 year weekly. Uh, and these are the NASDAQ futures. Maybe the NASDAQ isn't the best choice since it is weighted differently versus, um, I mean, I got some drawings here on the S and P. So I want to delete those, uh, right here. So remember the entire crash of 2008, the, the great recession, whatever you might want to call it. I mean, check this out. This is pretty cool. I don't know. Um, but, you know, we sold off back in, in 2007, 2008 from some 14,000 all the way down to 6460. 6460. Right. And that's, uh, look, the futures just opened here. Dow's down another 300 points. Um, it'll probably normalize here in a sec, but, uh, and then probably go lower. I feel like there hasn't been a reason for the market to, to really want to trade higher. Everything's been bad news, but anyways, but look at the, the, the distance and I kind of highlighted it here already. The distance from 14,000 to 6460 is the exact same distance from 29,543 uh, and well beyond where we're, you know, well, not well beyond, but well opposite of beyond <laughs> where we currently are right now at 825, 20,825, 850. And the volatility should pick up um, as well. But anyways, it's the same exact distance. And instead of it happening within... Uh, you know, pretty much an entire year's worth of trading. Uh, it's it's only happened in just a few days. Isn't that crazy? I don't know. I just I found that pretty pretty insane. But when you when you calculate it percentage wise, obviously you know we had a what was this like a near you know fifty plus percent drop versus what we have here which is minus uh, 20, uh, let's call it 23. I don't have the real numbers, just a guess, uh, 23%. No, I didn't start at, I didn't start at five, um, 555. I, I did open up the room here a little bit, but we're not talking bits just yet. I'm just kind of talking to talk. Um, just, 
you know, the, the insane uh, move that we had here um, in stocks and in the futures markets. It's pretty, pretty incredible. But then, you know, that this is just pretty much ignoring the insane move we've had to the upside, right? So, I mean, am I worried at minus 23%? I don't think so. Um, I think, you know, if there's going to be uh, the dip of all dips, this is probably it. And uh, it seems like, I mean, I don't remember, to be honest, uh, I wasn't trading during the, finan uh, the financial crisis back in 2008. Uh, in fact, I was a freshman in college at that point. So, um, and that's when I first started getting interested in, in stocks. I didn't even know what the heck recession meant at that point. So I have no idea how the Fed behaved during this fall, but, you know, in, in this dramatic drop here, uh, you know, the Fed has intervened a couple of times, um, but, you know, it's just straight failure. And the crazy thing is, is that if we were to take, and I, I know this is uh, uh, a course I'm working, uh, I'm currently working on, so, so uh, spoiler alert, but if we were to take like a volume profile of all of this, uh, you know, let's, let's call it uh, from here to the highs, right? From the low to the high. And we were to take a, a market profile or a volume profile. You know, this large cluster of trading here would probably be a pretty big high volume node, right? And I, I do know what recession means now. Yes, I do know what a recession means. Um, do I have the best definition for it? Probably not. <laughs> but, you know, back in 2008, yeah, no, I was just a kid. But anyways, probably like, a, you know, probably go, looks like this, right? Got that big distribution. Here you got a lot of consolidation. I got another distribution there, right here, another bell-shaped curve. And I know this is way off topic, and I'll get on topic in a sec. But the worrisome part is that this, this probably has a lot more to go because we didn't have a lot of trading time spent in this area right here. So, you know, we probably don't have a lot of volume. We don't have a lot of time spent around these prices. So we could do one of two things. We could reject that area and revert back to this mean and potentially new all-time highs and or uh, we, we take it out, right? We take it out and we sort of move over to the next magnet where it's kind of this level of, of trading volume where we consolidated for the good part of almost two years. <clears throat> so what's going to happen? I don't know, but I'm, I'm leaning... I'm leaning very bearish. And, uh, and, and one last thing, uh, if you guys remember last week, I had that trade in Google. My goodness. I mean, I, I haven't traded too much this week at all because I've just been hanging out in Google and United Airlines, which have both worked incredible. Uh, I'm out of all Google here. And today was when I finally took off uh, the rest of my Google position. And this one was based on Elliott Wave. We talked about this. We had, you know, the sequence. So we had one, two, three. We got the fourth wave pull back into the zone. And now we're waiting for a reason to get short. And uh, we had uh, a proper pullback in the oscillator right between the 90 and 140. And uh, I decided to take the short right as the uh, stochastic crossover was happening. I figured, hey, we've already sold off this much. Um, if things get pretty bad, we're probably gonna continue to go lower. And we did, and I uh, took the time here just to uh, mark where I took profits here. You know, it doesn't look like much, but 
you know, when we take a look here, I was short 1500 shares. Um, I took my, my first profit target right here at the open of that big gap down, um, right around close to 1200. It was, I think it was around 12, uh, 12, I forget, to be honest, 12, 10, 12, you know, I wanted it right at 1200, but they didn't give it to me. So then I chased it up to get rid of uh, 300 shares. Um, that came out to 135 points in profit. And then as the market started coming up on, on pretty good news, I was like, nah, maybe I'm going to let go of a few and then hold the rest uh, and hope for another rollover to the downside, which we did get. Uh, but that second exit here was good for 100 points and 26 cents. And then, you know, today was, uh, you know, the day for me to get out. I'm like, you know what? Um, I don't want to be greedy here. And the market has rewarded me with 200 points in Google. That's freaking insane. Um, you know, best trade I've ever had in Google was uh, for 120 points. I, I definitely beat that right here. And that was years ago. That was years ago. Um, and then right here, I mean, just, just insane uh, for the last 500 shares. So, you know, I've pretty much, uh, I could stop trading here for the rest of the year and, and, and be good. So I'm really glad I took this trade. I'm going to keep looking for these kinds of trades, but, uh, you know, as they appear, I'll take them. And if, if things just get worse, guys, I mean, you know, I, I hate to say it, but you know, you, you, you keep on trading um, and we get another opportunity. You know, it's certainly well worth taking. So let's get back on topic here. Today we're talking bits. Um, so finally, how much did you make? So we can do the math, but uh, that Google trade netted me close to 220,000 um, in profit. So it was, it's pretty, pretty spectacular. Uh, I, I can't forget about Uncle Sam though. So I don't want to spend it all in one place when you know next year's tax bill is, is looking pretty high uh, and that's the bummer that's one thing that you know whenever i have a huge day like that or a huge trade uh, i always like to think well you know what would what will uncle sam take and then it makes me just sick <laughs> and then just hey let let me let me not even pretend it's there so really great trade there and just, just, you know, the potential of uh, the, the tools that we trade with at Wave 5 Trading or Trade the Fifth. I know it's like a little confusing sometimes, but Trade the Fifth. Um, and I hope to uh, continue to have some more killer trades like that just and, and showcase them to, to you guys. Um, and the UAL trade, that one was not um, based on anything way five trading. Um, it was mostly like, uh, hello, coronavirus. Trump said he's canceling incoming flights from specific countries. And, uh, you know, that's going to hurt profits bad. So I just went for the short. I'm like, Hey, I mean, the market's selling off. Let me, let me get, let me get a little action in the airlines. And I mean, today the, the United Airlines <laughs> closed at the lows. Um, I'm up pretty big on that one um, as well. But uh, let's get to the topic here. Bits. So bits, it's, you know, the way I like to think about bits is day trading. I like bits for day trading. Uh, I'm not sure how I feel about it when it comes to swing trading, unless we have some other confirmation maybe like uh you know we're taking out some kind of pivot high for example let's let's put this is a five minute of the nasdaq futures but let's pretend that it's a daily chart right and you know we we got these lows here and if we had a bit signal right and this is just pretending we have a daily chart so we got these lows and we get a bit signal and we take out those lows we're probably going to continue to move lower so if, you know, I, I would want some 
confirmation like that, especially on a higher time frame. But on short time frames, uh, like we have here with the uh, with the Nasdaq futures on the five minute here, uh, you know, the bids for day trading I think is is excellent. Uh, so I'm going to focus more on the day trades versus the swing trades when it comes to bids. Not saying one is better or the other. Excuse me. I just find the, the bits uh, a bit more helpful when we have number one, you know, trending conditions, which I think we've had, whether it's to the upside or to the downside uh, in the markets uh, these past couple of weeks. And um, I think certainly for day trading is how we want to take a look at it. So it's real simple, right? The indicator does everything for you. And once it, uh, formulates a signal, then it will lay out this kind of like, you know, I like to think of it, it looks like a cake in layers, right? So you got this red line, which I just painted over. So you got this red line, you got this green line, then this blue, yellow, purple, blue, but solid, right? And simply what this is, is the breakout line, right? So that's letter number one in bits, breakout. So it stands for breakout intelligent trading signals. And I know definitely breaking breakout intelligence, the TS, I'm just going to throw a guess out there, trading signals, but it's a breakout strategy, right? That's all pretty much we need to know. It's a breakout strategy. So, the indicator has its mechanics, a lot of it based on volume. And what we'll have is, you know, all these color candles like this, right? So uh, red means that we had more volume than the previous bar. Green means we had more volume to the upside, obviously, versus the previous bar. Um, and the blue and gray are kind of neutral. Like we didn't have any more uh, volume than the previous bar. Uh, and, you know, I kind of like to think about it as kind of neutral, right? It's, it's, it's not going to generate a bit signal. So when I'm looking at the bits, you know, I, I really want to focus on the green and on the red candles. Um, and those are the ones that generate, usually generate a signal thereafter. And then we have uh, the moving average set uh, with a point of control in the moving average, um, which is in dots. So once a signal is generated, it creates the little cake layer or pretty much the breakout area. So this is kind of like a consolidation range that we're gonna look to try to break in order to get into a trade. So the red means stop loss, right? Red, red is bad. Green is go, right? So we want to get into the trade at the green. And if we are in a trade, we'd want to get out ideally for a loss at the red. Okay, does that make sense? I mean, I know most of us know, but if we have a few new people to bits, I just wanna kinda of make it as simple as I can, right? Signal is generated. We don't take a long or a short immediately thereafter. We wait for a breakout of the green and the red is just drawn there as a, as a stop loss. Right. It doesn't necessarily mean, hey, it hit the red before the green. Does that mean I don't take the trade? No, that's not what it means. It means that if you're in the trade already, that's where you would want to get out for a loss. Don't make it any more than that. You could certainly make it less than that. But then at that point, it's just kind of discretionary. So if we're, if we're trading the bits and we want to trade it, the way it's meant to be traded, you know, that's where we would get out. So for example, let's just continue honing in on this uh, 
on this example here. So here, bits generated a signal. So, hey, Raul, uh, what do I do here? Real simple. Um, as long as the market doesn't move extremely fast on you, you're going to have a little bit of time to plan your entry. So what you'll do is you'll place an order to sell since this is a short signal right at this green line. Uh, we're just going to use an estimate here, which is 73.15. Okay. This is the NASDAQ futures. 73.15. Okay. 73.15. Now you might wonder, well, bro, I mean, I place a limit order. I'm, I'm going to get filled at the best, at the next best, best price and get filled immediately. Well, what we want to do is we want to place a stop order, right? Just because it's called a stop order doesn't mean it's a stop loss. It's just the name of a type of order where, um, it's the same as a limit order. And, you know, you might disagree with that a little bit, but it's the same as a limit order or a market order. But what happens is it doesn't trigger right away. Price has to come down, touch that price, and then it gets filled the same way a stop loss would, right? So if, if I'm long here and short here, so just long, sorry, with a stop loss right here, right? In order for me to realize the stop loss, price has to come down to it, right? I don't get filled right away when I place a stop order. So let's just pretend I'm no longer long. Price has to come down to this area, to this price, for me to execute on this stop order. So that's just, all it is is an order type. So we place a stop limit or stop market, would be buy stop market, buy stop limit. And then we wait for the market to come down, let it get filled, and then lay out your targets, which would be target one, two, three, four, if you have four targets. If you got two targets, I mean, it, it becomes subjective at that point. You know, you as the trader uh, would have to make that decision. But obviously target one is gonna have a higher probability of touch versus target four, right? Because on every bits trade, you know, target four uh, is never guaranteed and neither is target one, but obviously the higher probability is going to be on target one because it's the one that price would have to go to first before it goes all the way to target four. Okay, so just, Target one, I think, is usually a good place to take profit, uh, as in for yellow, purple, and blue down here. That becomes uh, kind of your choice. If you want to have four targets, you lay them all out. If you want to have two targets, maybe target one and this area for target two which would be, you know, multiples against your, your risk. So I think this would be target one is 50 times your total risk uh, or, or half your total risk. Uh, one to one reward to risk would be right here. One and a half reward to risk would be here and two times double your money would be at target four.
okay? So in this specific trade here, we lay out our stop uh, limit order or market, whatever you want it to, to be. And what's cool here also is, and you know, let me, let me just use this, it's kind of better. So this would be where we would go short. Now, like I was saying, what would be, what's also pretty cool here, the fact that you have a little bit of time to plan your trade, you already know where your potential targets are gonna be. You lay out your stop, uh, your sell stop right there. And then you place limit buy orders at your targets. So as soon as you're filled, everything's going to be already laid out for you because you will have done it before the market fills you at this price. Now this trade uh, got target one, target two, target three, and if probably I keep going to the right here. Um, could have gotten target four. In fact, I think it did. Um, very late. I mean, actually it did hit target four, but that was, you would have to hold it all the way through to the Globex open. So let's take a look at uh, just a little bit of what happened here in the NASDAQ today. And let's just talk about it from the open. So uh, early in the futures, uh, trading shortly after the Globex, uh, we, we had a little run up and then we sold off uh, pretty heavily here as the speech where Trump was uh, talking about the coronavirus and such. Uh, it wasn't too pleasing to traders. Uh, it didn't give them any more confidence to wanna hold on to their money. So they just kept selling the market. Um, uh, and eventually, and I, I don't know why, because uh, it, it triggered a limit down. I feel like, you know, it, it triggered here around 7.55 a.m. Eastern time. And the funny thing is that, you know, I feel like there was, a you know, that low is equal to a low we made here at 5.30. So why didn't they close it at 5.30 versus, I don't know. It is what it is. Uh, but they held the market and then um, sold off immediately, uh, triggered another circuit breaker here. So you, you can kind of see that gap down from this bar to this one. It's about a, you know, 42 and a half, 30 and a half. So about a 12 point gap down from, uh, you know, call it slippage since it's kind of intraday. And then the market just kind of, uh, Chop, trades back up, chops around exactly where we had that uh, that limit down. And then it finally started swinging lower here. And that finally triggered uh, a short here on the bits. And what you would have done here is, once you see the signal is triggered, here's where your short, uh, where your short is. Now, why is it a short? That's a good question. Um, so we have a green and a red line, right? So if we have a green and then we have a red underneath it, this equals a long signal. Okay. So vice versa, if we have a green underneath the red, like such, green, red, this would equal a short. So that's, that's what the difference is, right? Short versus long. Now, this is Ninja Trader 8. So, uh, you know, it's a little bit different than then think or swim. Let me pull up think or swim here. Uh, and let's go on to that same scenario, uh, NASDAQ futures, and let's switch it to the five minute. Uh, uh, what's nice about what? Um, just, just real quick guys, can you, can you see and hear me correctly? 
So I just got a message from Zoom saying uh, the internet was kind of off. So I don't know if it kind of gapped in. Okay, so it's, I think it said unstable. Voice was breaking up a little bit. Yeah, I think that's what happened. Um, it says it's it's fine now looking at it, but uh, anyways. Um, so what's cool about the think or swim version, and I, I think this is something I need to talk to Paul about, um, just to add it to the Ninja Trader version. Whenever we have a short signal or a long signal, there's uh, usually a, a down arrow or an up arrow associated with the trade. And with Ninja Trader here, uh, you don't really have that. You just kind of have, you know, the signal appears and there you go, take the trade. <clears throat> so let's continue on with, uh, with Thinkorswim here. Same exact chart, same exact signals. And this is the show we were talking about. Right, so the market gap down, halted, little mini gap down, swinging back to where that limit down was, and then swinging back down. There's your first short signal. So the idea here would be, hey, I need to get short right at that green line. Okay, we got a bit short. This is where I want to be, unless price obviously trades well beyond where this red line would be, or we got a crossover like this to the upside in the moving averages, then, you know, this would, that would be kind of like the only scenario we don't want to, um, that would be the only scenario we don't want to be in. So right here, the short would be 7409, maybe 7409 and a quarter. Uh, think or swim doesn't do a good job here with the with the price axis there's no such thing as 7409 with 15 cents in the futures but that would be where the short is uh with target one being 73.39 and as you can see uh that was achieved from right here to the bottom of this green bar right there and at that point, I mean, stops that break even. That's what I would do. Stops that break even. And as the market keeps moving down to target and target, I would just keep moving my stop. You know, if we hit target one, stop at break even. We hit target two, stop at target one. We hit target three, stop at target two. Kind of like step it down um, the further and further we go. Uh, just just to protect some profit. I mean, that's just something I would do. Again, you as the trader, you have the choice of what you'd like to do. Okay. Uh, now, usually when we're in a trend, we we get multiple bid signals. So this is kind of building in the confidence for this first trade, this first bids trade. Uh, and I I mean, technically, right here as well, you could have gotten short, which would have been a better price at 74.37. Right here was the bid signal and the short at the green line, 74.39, 74.37. Again, with the volatility, uh, you know, sometimes you're not going to get like the perfect fill because prices just are moving very fast uh, unless you catch it at the right time when the market just kind of slow down, takes a breath and then moves. Uh, and that hit obviously different targets. Now, um, you'll notice that there is a variation with the range per as you know, per target. So that's all average true range based. So for example, this first bid signal right here is the distance from entry to target versus this little mini second bid signal. And here's the distance from entry to target, right? We can physically see that the, that the length the market has to travel to get to that first target is much less or much more depending on which one you're looking at. They're not equal. Uh, and the risk on uh, good, great question. Uh, you know, I'm kind of like moving, talking more of like, uh, profit potential rather than risk. 
But on this one, you know, the entry's at 74.40, uh, and the stop would be at 75.20. That's a lot of risk, right? Uh, it's even more right here at 74.11 to 75.44. It's well over 100 points of risk. Um, nobody said that, you know, minus 10% markets would be cheap. It's going to come at a premium. Um, at that case, the safest bet is to switch over to the micro uh, e-minis, micro e-minis, or just plain micro NASDAQs or micro S&Ps, um, just because it does reduce uh, a lot more risk. Or you could be clever and you can hedge positions with options. So for example, if I'm short, the NASDAQ, maybe I'm going to get long some, you know, one or two calls. Or I could be even more savvy and short the NASDAQ. Uh, well, it wouldn't be there. Let's say short the NASDAQ right here. And then get long the, get long a straddle. So long calls and long puts. So if the underlying continues to trade lower, my straddle is going to continue to gain in value, at least on the put side. I could let go of this leg in the option, and now I'm profiting from both the underlying and the put. Or I'm short the market, right? Short the NASDAQ futures, long the straddle, And if the market turns uh, not in my favor, I can let go of this put uh, option and use the calls to sort of protect uh, my risk. But that, that's, that's just way more complicated than it really needed to be. I just want to throw it out there, um, you know, for those of you who, you know, might be interested in some hedging strategies. Okay, that's one way to do it. Now, uh, preferably on a five minute chart, I wouldn't try um, a situation like that. I'd probably increase it to a little bit larger um, time frame, but it's, it's just, it's not crazy, but it's, it's just something, it's a reality that we're dealing with right now in the futures. Okay. It's a reality that we're facing right now just the, the risk has gone up in by a whole lot okay now question about the continuous signals right so um multiple continuous signals uh, could you hedge in using multiple continuous signals um you could you could because right um as the market is trending lower and we get signal, 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 signal. Uh, at one point, we know that one of those signals is going to fail. I mean, it's, it's just a matter of probability. One of those signals is going to fail. Um, so you could hedge if you happen to get short at that one signal that fails. But um, I was just talking hedging in a sense of kind of reducing that uh you know that that risk <laughs> because it is pretty large you know this was what like 130 point risk uh this little one was more in the range of like 80 points so i mean you know the candlesticks don't look that big but you know when you compare it to the right axis here uh th th those swings are are rather large especially with the leverage Okay, makes sense. So let's move on here. Um, so we get tons of signals, right? And we could add to winning positions. I always encourage that um, as long as you know that by adding to your winning position, you could potentially reduce your profit if the market doesn't go the right way after you've added. But 
it's better than doubling down when you're losing because that's when things get pretty dangerous. Um, so as, as a continuation of these signals, you can continue to, uh, you know, dabble and adding on to your position if you've entered early. But, uh, you know, with, with the market the way it is right now, they could be a little bit of a, a dangerous proposition. But if you want to leverage up on a trade, it should definitely be when you have a position that is winning not when it's losing. Okay. Uh, then you get that injection of liquidity from the Fed, which gets faded right away. And then we have just more short signals. It's been nothing but shorts in the NASDAQ. And this one here uh, was the one we first talked about. Moved lower. Here's that second one shortly, uh, you know, within the five minute range after that takes it lower, hits target one, uh, crosses over onto the next day. We did just have a bid signal uh, here in the NASDAQ futures. This one, as you can see, uh, didn't trigger a short, which would have been here around 70.20. And as you can see, the price is just, uh, just starting to move uh, well off that area. But if it could reverse back down, I don't see why we shouldn't take that 70, uh, 70, 19 and three quarter trade. I don't think it's that bad. Um, but let's have a look at, um, at another market. I mean, the Russell 2000 features <laughs> this market, uh, I think has been the one that's gotten the most heavily beat up when we take a look at a 15, uh, at a 15 year, uh, we don't have that much information here in the Russell because RTY, it used to be forward slash TF, but um, that would be the, the ICE Russell futures. The E-mini Russell on the CME uh, was just recently introduced not that long ago. So let's take a look at the ETF. That would be IWM. And this one's, I mean, it never made an all-time high. And it's pretty much, if we compare it to where the Dow is, right? We were taking a look at the Dow futures. So let's take a look at the Dow futures, right? So we have this consolidation period, big push up, consolidation period, all time high, and then here's the sell off. Okay, now we have the Russell never made an all-time high. It got stuck in its own consolidation period. And it's already down to its previous consolidation period after that big move to the upside here. So one more time, just switching over to the Dow, you can see, you know, the Dow, you know, th this is where the Russell is right now. The Dow hasn't made it to that consolidation period we had there. So that's just interesting. I'm not saying the Russell is a leader, but damn, it, it's, it's, it's been getting smoked. Uh, so let's take a look at it on the five minute and then we'll take a look at a slightly higher time frame as well. So looking at the Russell here, um, just for today, same situation. I mean, it is a, an index, looks very similar like the NASDAQ futures. You know, the short was here, then it kind of crept up here on this second bit signal short, move lower, lower, lower. And you might be asking yourself, well, I mean, you know, if I'm looking at all these charts and I happen to miss one trade, you know, how can I avoid that? And that's where the smart list comes in, right? So Paul and the team at, uh, trade the fifth have come up with this very unique watch list called the smart list. Uh, they have it for futures and for stocks. Um, and I think Forex might be upcoming. Uh, but because this indicator uses uh, volume, you know, Forex 
doesn't typically deal in, in, in volume, kind of like how futures and stocks do, uh, though you can calculate some of the volume in, in, in a sense by using uh, uptick, downtick model, which means, you know, every uptick is, you know, it has a specific amount of volume and every downtick. Um, it's not very complicated. It might be new to you. I don't want to spend too much time on that, but they, they calculate volume uh, in, in a unique way, which, you know, I'm not going to say it's 100% accurate, but it kind of depicts what's going on. Uh, you know, if, if we were talking order flow in a sense. Um, but let's take a look at some smart lists. So this is a membership that you would have to access. And there's two smart lists, as I said, you have the futures smart list and the stocks uh, for swing trading signals. So let's go to the smart list here for the futures and see if uh, what we got here. So it's pretty much a watch list uh, of every future symbol, except for ice futures, just because, you know, ice data comes to such a high premium. Not everybody trades ice futures. I don't even pay for ice data. Um, just because I don't, I don't trade cocoa. I don't trade sugar. Um, you know, the only market I'd be interested in trading in the, you know, ice with ice data would be the FTSE 100. But even then, you know, I'm just not willing to, to give it a shot. It's just too much, uh, too much for a market. I'm not going to trade too often. Okay. But anyways, we don't have too many signals here on the five minute, um, on the Canadian dollar, there was a short that came on, uh, that triggered here at eight, uh, sorry, uh, at 6 15 PM, the entry 7186, uh, with targets laid out. Let's take a look at that one. That's on the five minute. And the time was 1815. This actually hit target one. So right here, you can see uh, 71, 82, could be a little bit of difference in data. 7186 was what was flagged here. Um, a good question for Paul would be, you know, who is the data provider here? But uh, the bit signal was there. Um, and the smart list caught it, the next step would be to trade it. Uh, so this one, 7182 on thinkorswim with uh, that first target being 7177. And you can see that one was hit right here on this bar at 625 p.m. And then at that point, what I would do, again, this becomes subjective, but just to protect capital, if I have multiple targets, I leave those targets out, but I would move my stop to break even where I would get the rest of my position taken out. <clears throat> Infinity futures. Okay, so that's where the data is being pulled from. That's good to know. I've never had them have, as a data provider. I've never used um, their platform either. So I, I don't have much to say about that. But hey, if you caught it at 86, you know, you got four ticks better. Um, the euro was along, that was in the afternoon here. Again, on the five minute, that's 6E. And that was at, no, let me swing this back here. The euro, that was at 335 or 1535 PM, 1535. So it was talking about this one. And that one was a good trade, um, triggered kind of late into the uh, the swing to the upside here, but um, not at a bad location. 12.07, uh, hit target one, didn't quite reach that second target there. Um, but I mean, if we look at the euros, it's kind of like the same situation. 
you know, when we get those bullish, uh, those bearish trends, we're going to get nice bid signals. We get those bullish trends, we get them as well. Um, one thing I haven't talked about is the bias, and it's right there in front of my face. So we got the bias. This is also part of the uh, the bits suite, and uh, you know this looks at multiple time frame analysis for the underlying, and uh, pretty much uh, it doesn't tell you bit signals for multiple time frames, but it tells you pretty much. Um, where um, price is on multiple time frames, you know, downtrend, uptrend, uh, neutral. And that's right, you, you can't trade all the signals, okay? You can't trade all the signals, but what I've noticed is the first trade is usually one of the best ones, right? Because that one captures a potential big move early. And if you can catch that first one, and I'm you know, just cherry picking this one because it's right in front of my face. But if you get into this first trade here, so right here at 1035 was pretty much the first bit signal you know, after the open of the stock market, okay? And the short was right here at 1135, okay? There it is. If you choose to add to your position, you could. Um, and other bid signals would be the place to do it. But usually that first big signal, I think is usually the best. Okay. So usually what will happen is we got the moving averages. If the blue is, you know, if the, if the fast moving average is below the slow moving average, we got a bearish, uh, we get bearish bid signals. Once we get that crossover, we don't see any bearish bid signals here. It's nothing but bullish. Um, so the moving averages are kind of like the filter. The bid signals are the signals we want to trade. And again, I'm going to emphasize day trading because this is, uh, you know, just based on my experience, Swing trading the bits, I don't have too much experience with that, okay? I have experience with day trading, and I actually like it for day trading a little bit better, simply because I, sometimes I just don't have the patience for swing trades when I know, um, when I have just that little bit more comfort when it comes, you know, using Elliott Wave for that type of trading decision for swing trades. Um, but if I can get a bit signal combined with an Elliott wave signal, you know, win, win, I might feel a little inclined to leverage up a little bit since we got two confirming factors. And then the other filter would be the, uh, the bias. I mean, we have these long signals here, all these long bits, but the bias was kind of neutral. I mean, kind of shifted bullish a little bit right here when we broke, uh, broke out of this one here. This one was a loser. Um, winner, you know, kind of gave you positive uh, P&L. Ultimately, it reversed right to the tick. Stop. All right. Then we could take a look at other time frames. Let's take a look at, let's just go to the highest time frame here on the 60 minute on the smart list. So doesn't look like we have anything here on the 60 minute. No signals. Okay. Let's move on to the 30 minute. Okay. On the 30 minute, let's take a look at a different uh, future here. Kind of wish crude or gold would give us something. Let's take a look at the yen. So the yen uh, was so long at 4.30 a.m. Uh, that was too long ago. Um, let's bring it down to the 15 minute. So as you can see uh, at different, duh, powered by infinity futures, right in my face. But um, we can continue to look at different time frames. the one we feel most comfortable with trading. And 
looking for bid signals using a watch list. And it's not a watch list that is, you know, specific to a platform. It's, you know, right off your web browser, you can have this information, even on a mobile phone, you can see this information. So it's pretty awesome. Okay. But heck, we could even go down to the one minute there we go. We got a we got a long and crude oil on the one minute. Let's go to that one. Crude oil on the one minute. Uh, okay. So this is where I'm just like, okay. So that's actually right now. I think that's this bar here. It's probably gonna give us a signal you can hear the the dinging here new signal developing in crude on the april contract that's the one i'm in Thirty-one twenty. i'm not seeing it tell me hey we're looking for a long at this price and a potential stop here and it just disappeared. It just disappeared. It seems like the rules didn't quite meet there. And with the market moving lower, um, looks like it, it just kind of auto reset right there. Okay, so we'll just keep that to the side. Now, uh, we got a few minutes left and I kind of wanted to share uh, something with you guys just a, a little something a, a little different way of looking at trading bits okay just a little different way of looking at it but it's it kind of it's kind of restrictive to different platforms it's something you can't do on thinkorswim you can do it on TradeStation, but you can't do it on Thinkorswim. I think you could do it on TradingView, but that's the use of what are called Renko bars. Now, just by a show of hands or, you know, type the letter Y, if you know what a Renko bar is. You got a no, a yes, a yes, a yes. Got another yes. So that's good. Um, so Renko bars, just to explain uh, to, the, to the no, Renko bars are, it's a candlestick but it's a range-based candlestick, not one based on time. So, so far for all these examples here, you know, we've been looking at, you know, the 15 minute bar here in crude oil. Over here, we're looking at the, the 30 minute here. You know, let's take a look at the daily, right? It's all based on time. The calculation of each bar based on a specific amount of time that we as a trader choose. But what about a specific range, right? So if we measure, let's say from this low to this high, so 3182 to 3071, that's about a one point range, right? Let's say I wanted a one point or a hundred tick Renko bar. What would need to happen is price would have to move that entire point and if we compare it to a 15 minute bar, that took one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, uh, call it 11 actually, 11 total 15 minute bars. But if we were using a 100 tick Renko or a one point crude oil market, right? 100 ticks, 100 tick Renko, that would be one bar instead of 11. You see how that could 
throw uh, the time sort of out of the equation, and only focus on range. So that's how they work. So yes, think or swim does have Renko, but watch what happens. When uh, you got to have what's called tick data. And tick data is, is pretty much the volume for every tick that price, you know, action moves through. So for example, you know, here we have a high of 36, 33.60 and a low of 30, holy crap. Um, it would know every, every volume at every tick. decline that call every volume at every tick think or swim wherever they receive their data from they don't have that so when I switch over to range and then Renko and let's just use a 55 tick range just for example's sake you can see that I don't have any bid signals at all I mean even if I looked at more than just one day. Let's take a look at 10 days. Looking at 10 days on a 55 tick, you can see, you know, not one signal was generated. Um, that's not an indicator. But uh, when I go over here, let's see, futures, show volume subgraph, apply price axis, or right here, overlap volume. I, I, I got nothing, right? I don't see any volume. That's because volume is not accounted for. So that's the only problem. So you have Renko, Trade Station has Renko. Um, and you also have um, Ninja Trader who has Renko's, and that's kind of why I'm bringing this up because there's been some pretty cool things I've uh, I've done here with Renko bars. Now, so you have Renko, and then you have what's called Unirenko, or short for Universal Renko, and a Universal Renko uh, looks like this. Okay. This is what a universal Renko looks like. It has an open, a high, a low, and a close, obviously, just like a candlestick. It's based on range. And the other thing is it's also modified. And I won't get too much into that. Uh, maybe next time I'll have a little bit more time and I'll, I'll prepare maybe a little better um to talk about this but it gives you a, a very smooth framework of uh for trading and for the bits so if we take a look at just today's trading um i wish again i had a little bit more time to explain this but it's kind of the same situation. We get the bit signal. And what's cool about this too is Renko bars are all the same range. So the average true range doesn't really um, doesn't really uh, change. So you're always going to have the same risk and the same reward. But I'm just gonna I'm just gonna throw this idea at you guys. I don't want to take up too much time here, and I can see I have a couple of questions I may have skipped over. So a lot of times it appears to be lost opportunities by not getting in at the crossovers even before the signals. As soon as you get the bias signal going the same way, so that may be the case. And let me just come back here and. Use a regular time frame. That may be the case where we have a crossover like so right here, um, and maybe on this one we could have had a bids, for example, right here. 
So right here we have a crossover on the moving average and then we get the bit signal and the short would be here. And Hey, yeah, there is loss potential. Uh, or lost profit potential, I should say. But it's just not part of the rules, right? That would be something more subjective, okay? And and that's that's my answer to you, uh, uh, George. You know, at that point, you're the trader. You decide. But if we want to follow the rules, we wait for the bid signal and we get short either at the breakout or we get long um, at the breakout. Okay, those are the two options. Um, so that's a decision you make as a trader. All right, so just to sort of come back over here to the Renko's. I'm just going to leave it floating out there for you guys to explore. And we can talk about that next week. Okay. Cause we could use, there's so many different types of bar types out there that we can use to manipulate price data that I just, you know, it's just, I've made a lot of my money not doing what everybody else is doing. Okay. <laughs> and I was, was kind of counterintuitive, but that that's kind of the point, right? If, if the crowd is using the five minute bar, I want to find a way to beat the crowd or get into a trade before the crowd. And there's so many different ways to, to do that. Renko's are one of them. There are bar types. There's ones that are called point and figure. Uh, there's others that are uh, one that's called line break. And I just kind of want to, you know, just as a, as a tip from me to you, I want to expose you guys to, you know, what more there is out there than a five minute bar or a three minute bar or a daily chart. Okay. So I'm not going to get too much into these Renko's today, but I want to float the idea uh, to you guys out there. I want, I want you guys to explore a little bit, right? Um, expand your horizons per se. Okay. Because we can certainly talk about that at a later time with, with a little bit more time. Okay. So, Coming back over to the bits, have a question here. Um, what are my thoughts on using uh, the point of control on the moving averages? That's a great question. Um, I would like to probably look at that on a smaller time frame. Let's take a look at, let's go back to a five minute and let's take a look at a bit signal, okay? Um, crude is kind of choppy. We want trending conditions for this. So let's, let's move on. Let's take a look at, a, uh, at the Dow on the five minute. Okay. Now let's, let me look for, um, I want to, I want to find a, a signal here. Let's take a look at this last one just before the, not this one, not this one. Let's take a look at this one here. So just before the close of the session, we get a two bit signals actually. We get one right here and we get the other right here. Relatively, uh, we're shorting around the same price at that point. So if you wanna take targets, you can take maybe target one. Okay, cool. But now that you took target one and maybe target two, maybe you want to use the point of control as a trailing stop, similar to a roller coaster. We 
which would have you out of the trade over here. You can do that. I don't see any reason why not. And also if it came to the point where you wanted to reduce your risk, that would be another way of using the point of control. So let's, let's assume here, um, let's say I got short right here. So that would be at 21,430 based off of this bit signal here that came in at 11.30. So I'm short there, it doesn't quite get to target one. And then it reverses and it goes against me. Sometimes, you know, in hindsight, we, you know, all of us would feel like, oh yeah, well we hold it and look, it works. It got to target one, but in real time, uh, emotions come into place, especially when our money is on the line. So if we're not willing to risk, so 747, 430, if we're not willing to risk 300 points, which was the risk on this trade, getting out at 548 from 425 sounds a whole lot better. So you can do that as well. Rather than taking the full stop, take a stop at the point of control as a way to sort of minimize your exposure. But at that point, for that type of trade, I, I would really just go to these, uh, to these Renko bars because time can lag sometimes and it can alter uh, the data if price isn't really doing anything. Like for example, here price moved sideways for one, two, three, four, five, for 25 minutes. And you'll notice that the point of control just moved lower and lower and lower. It kind of pushes you out of the trade sometimes if time lags before it moves. Make sense? So there's, there's lots of ways we can take a look at this. And, you know, a boot camp is kind of like the more appropriate type of uh, environment to really go into the many ways we can take a look at the bits. You know, one hour, as I've proven here, is, is not long enough. <laughs> it's, it's long enough to kind of, you know, go over a few charts and see how the bits performed. And it's been performing. Okay. So let's leave it here. And I got a little homework for, for everybody. Just, you don't have to do it. But just on your own free time, um, study, study different bar types. Okay, because there's there's different ways to to analyze price action, and if we can find a way that makes a lot more sense to us, or makes our life a little easier when it comes to analyzing, it's well worth exploring. You know, in our journey um, as traders. Okay, now um, as a last thing, because I keep seeing this bell here. Uh, Russell 2000 features on the one minute. Let's just take a look at what that looks like. There we go. Uh, we actually do have a bit signal here in the Russell 2000 futures. Okay. Looks pretty good. Not bad. Um, looks like it made a high here, very close to the stop. It's certainly not as high as 1106, so we have a potential lower high situation. Stop limit at 1097 with targets at 95, 94, 92, and 91. So 
Entry is 97. Stop is 1100. Uh, that's pretty low risk with a uh, pretty good uh, reward potential of about, um, what is that, seven points total, close to seven points, um, and potentially further. And at that point, if you're looking for further, then that point of control might be the, the way to look at it. Sound good? All right, guys, um, have a great night. I hope you guys uh, took something out of this. Um, don't forget to do your homework. And, uh, you know, be careful wherever you are in the world. Um, I know it's, it's uh, scary times right now with, uh, with the whole virus situation. Just stay safe, stay clean. You know, just, just for kicks here, I got my respirator. <laughs> you know, for when I go to the supermarket, I'm just playing. I mean, if I were to wear that, people would probably call the cops on me. Anyways, have a great night. Uh, be safe out there. Take care. And uh, let's do this again next time. Bye for now.